research has have failed to explain how and why stones formed in the urinary tract and uh, this is particularly so for calcium oxalate stones and I will mainly focus on this uh, uh, problem in this uh, uh, overview. Uh, the different research efforts have however resulted in a number of factors uh, that have been uh, uh, considered of importance for the stone formation um, either alone or in concert action. It is axiomatic uh, that without formation of a solid phase in urine there will be no stones and uh, without a sufficiently high supersaturation there will be no solid phase, no crystallization. It was uh, very early uh, demonstrated, which I think is important also to look at the, uh, some of the observations that have um, uh, been made and achievements that provide the basis for how we now will consider the different possibilities of stone formation in the urinary tract. And it was thus very early demonstrated that, that there was a higher supersaturation in recurrent stone formers than normal subjects, as has been discussed uh, repeatedly during this uh, meeting, uh, although there was an overlapping between the group. And subsequently, there has been a number of reports in the literature uh, showing uh, a similar outcome, uh, here uh, summarized by, by Alan, Ro Alan Rogers in a recent publication, also with an overlap between the group. But <coughs> uh, one of the conclusions that was drawn is that the calcium oxalate stone formation is a result of increased levels of supersaturation. And this has been and still is uh, uh, almost the only way in which patients clinically are evaluated today by measuring the iron activity products. From a physical chemical point of view, it is assumed that this uh, precipitation of a calcium oxalate crystals occurs in the upper part of the metastable range of supersaturation as an heterogeneous nucleation requiring a promoter, whereas the uh, homogeneous nucleation at the uh, high labile supersaturation has been considered impossible because these very high ion activity products never are met in at least not in final urine. So uh, in order to uh, establish such a, uh, an initial step of crystallization, we need some promoters. There are several promoters that have been dis identified and described, but let, me suf uh, let it be sufficient here to mention uh, just two of them, the acidic phospholipids and cell membranes that might be released from the proximal part of the nephron by oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation as uh, Syed Khan and his group has demonstrated. Another aspect that uh, must be mentioned in this regard is also the role of urate uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the bottom line of all, a number of research in this field um, came to the conclusion that uh, uh, there might be a salting out effect at high uh, concentrations of urate. However, urate uh, in high concentrations is not a common finding in uh, uh, all of these uh, patients. So um, the other hypothesis that might uh, lead to uh, pathologic crystallization is that we have an increased production of promoters that can induce nucleation. Now we, need, we know now that we have crystals in urine in both normals and stone formers, but an initial observation was that there were more crystals, larger crystals and more aggregated crystals in stone formers. And this uh, uh, stimulated the interest in search for um, factors that might uh, modify or inhibit the crystallization process. And also from the Leeds group, 
an inhibition index was um, uh, analyzed in stone formers and found to be lower in stone formers than in normal subjects. Uh, also, uh, in this case, with a considerable overlapping between the group. But when they f um, uh, made a, a, a recalculation to provide a saturation inhibitor index, a very good discrimination could be obtained between the recurrent stone formers and the controls. Subsequently, this was um, uh, replaced by the probability index, which we also have heard has a similar discriminating power. A lot of research was subsequently carried out on inhibitors and modulators, and this is just uh, a short list of macromolecules and small molecules that can contribute to this um, uh, in this process. And as I Khan showed yesterday, this list can be uh, very long. Many of these uh, uh, macromolecules were characterized and uh, analyzed in, in, in detail, and um, a number of and, and it was uh, also uh, known uh, from these studies that the inhibitors could uh, counteract growth of crystals, aggregation of crystals, adherence of crystals. They can also inhibit the nucleation or even promote nucleation by providing um, uh, binding sites for uh, calcium. Uh, in different groups in these macromolecules listed at uh, the bottom of the slide. Now, the conclusions drawn from several of these uh, studies were that there might be low concentrations of inhibiting factors, structural abnormalities of urinary macromolecules or blockage of their binding sites, or maybe simply a hypocitraturia that uh, resulted in an increased aggregation. However, the rich supply of inhibitors in final urine uh, indicates that there might be a very high protective power there. And in the beginning, uh, the, uh, uh, the analysis was uh, carried out in diluted urine, something that was very much criticized. But now, when we consider that this process might take place in a higher, at a higher level of the nephron, these diluted um, estimates might be of greater interest. So, uh, uh, the conclusion from this was that stone formation might be a result of some di uh, disturbed inhibition or moderation of the crystallization process. Clinically, we see the stones uh, free in the uh, pelvocalesial system, and one of the major aspects that was discussed was whether we, this uh, end result could be initiated by free or fixed particles. This was addressed already by Finlayson in the 1970s. And um, uh, their calculations uh, came to the conclusion that a fixed particle was necessary for the subsequent uh, development of a stone. These data were uh, 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 then recalculated by Koch and Kahn, uh, partly uh, as a result of um, um, additional information on, on the composition in uh, the nephron. And um, their conclusion was that uh, free particle crystallization might be theoretically possible. When we looked at the uh, supersaturation conditions in, your, in different uh, parts of the nephron and uh, calculated the driving force, the driving force was positive for calcium oxalate only in the lower collecting duct and the lecalysis, whereas for calcium phosphate, uh, positive values were recorded in the whole nephron, particularly so in the loop of Henle. So uh, uh, this uh, draw, uh, was pos uh, resulted in a conclusion that if this was a process that started in the nephron, uh, uh, the initial phase would be calcium phosphate. And in fact, calcium phosphate is the most commonly encountered solid phase in urine. Now, recently, uh, uh, Bill Robertson have um, uh, used uh, um, uh, simulation of the uh, fluctuations in urine composition in hyd hydrodynamics and um, came to the conclusion that both calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate might form at the end of the descending loop of Henle. Uh, 
and uh, in terms of calcium oxalate precipitation, this might occur when you have a high plasma concentration of oxalate or a high ratio between oxalate and calcium. So, uh, accordingly, crystals that might form here, either of calcium phosphate, if they are well controlled by the inhibitors, might be excreted with urine, and the same might, of course, be true for the small crystals of calcium oxalate, giving us the uh, normal crystalluria that we saw. I will come back to that problem shortly, but um, uh, uh, the basic conclusion is that calcium oxalate stone formation accordingly might be initiated by free particle precipitation in the nephron. Now we have to uh, go to the uh, more recent uh, uh, observations that have become um, uh, possible to do with the uh, good optics in the, in the new endoscopic instruments showing that calcium oxalate um, uh, were attached to the papillary surface and um, more so to the calcium phosphate deposits that we recognize as the Randall's plaque, which were demonstrated 70 years ago, forgotten or neglect neglected after that, but now uh, brought up in light again. We have two possibilities, either a sub-epithelial calcium phosphate precipitate or uh, a plug in the two, in the, uh, at the end of the collecting duct. And um, these two might, uh, uh, under certain circumstances, result in um, calcium oxalate induced by the surface of the calcium phosphate. Now, the uh, in interesting question is, of course, how can the um, uh, sub-epithelial deposit of calcium phosphate um, uh, 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 come about? Uh, well, we can have a calcium phosphate precipitation in the ascending loop of Henle. These crystals can be transported through the cells, between the cells, or they can be uh, uh, dissolved by lysosomal enzymes with the release of calcium phosphate that results in pre uh, re-precipitation in the basement membrane of calcium phosphate subsequently extended to the sub-epithelial uh, level. Another alternative is that the calcium absorption, reabsorption that occurs in the thick ascending loop of Henle is taken up by the capillaries, uh, transported down to the papillary tip, and they're released into the interstitial tissue with reprecipitation in the same way as I just mentioned. Another interesting and uh, probably important uh, idea is that uh, there might be an um, uh, oxidative stress that uh, results in inflammation and calcium phosphate deposition in the interstitial tissue in the, at the, when uh, there is lack of antioxidants and high supersaturation with calcium phosphate. And this inflammation uh, might also activate macrophages and monocytes uh, so that um, uh, uh, this might be a normal uh, clearing process uh, to remove calcium phosphate. Um, another uh, idea was uh, formulated by Stoller and co-workers who collected evidence from the literature and uh, they come to the conclusion that this was an atherosclerotic-like uh, reaction with leakage of cholesterol and lipids that caused this precipitation of calcium phosphate. So the uh, uh, stone formation might thus be uh, a result of such a pathologic um, deposition of calcium phosphate. The calcium phosphate that is uh, located sub-epithelially uh, doesn't uh, play any pathologic role as long as the epithelium is intact, but the, and the epithelium is um, uh, er er eradicated uh, for some reason, probably by the toxic effect of the calcium crystals. They will, uh, these calcium phosphate particles will be exposed to um, uh, urine and the high supersaturation with calcium oxalate. Uh, uh, and at low pH, uh, dissolution might occur in the 
uh, macromolecular environment that now will uh, cover the crystals and surround the calcium phosphate crystals and possibly osteopontin with their binding sites of calcium will further concentrate the calcium and, re and go to very high ion activity products and in the presence of Tamhorsfeld protein that also at a low pH and a high calcium a concentration and high ion strength will result in an aggregation of crystals so that we have uh, an embryo stone on the surface of calcium phosphate. And whether this is uh, uh, a growth of uh, uh, calcium oxalate on the surface of calcium phosphate uh, is not quite sure. I think, however, that it might be something that is more like a homogeneous nucleation of calcium oxalate than a growth. So the calcium oxalate stones are induced by these deposits of calcium phosphate. Under circum circum uh, other circumstances, calcium phosphate might be accumulated and is a plug in the uh, end of the collecting duct. Uh, and this gives rise to uh, calcium oxalate at both these sides. And if you have um, the, uh, the uh, very high pathologic crystallization of calcium oxalate, we can also get a, purely calcium, a pure calcium oxalate deposit here that might result in that. So um, there are different ways. However, I don't think that we can incriminate any single factor as responsible for the stone formation, but rather that we have a number of factors starting at the upper uh, part of the nephron that might reduce, induce promotion and crystallization of calcium phosphate, subsequent crystallization of calcium oxalate that grows as a fixed stone embryo to be dislodged and finally get the free stone that is clinically important. Thank you.